And I'm going to talk to you today about the Hawker Hurricane, how it came to be and how it helped to save Britain. The Hurricane was a result of many circumstances over the years before the end product was reached. Now, my particular interest came about from having flown old aeroplanes. I'd flown the Spitfire, which is a little bit like flying Excalibur. And I'd also flown the Hurricane, different versions of it, including the Mark 12, which is a Canadian Mark II, and the Mark IV, which went on to be the tank buster. I'd also flown the Hawker biplanes that preceded it. And this is what attracted my interest in how did these aircraft get to be designed? There has been a shortage of research in how they physically came to be. So I'd flown them for a number of years and I decided to take a period of research at University of Birmingham. So I went and studied with Peter Gray and James Pugh at Birmingham and ended up with my masters. And it was based on how these Hawker designs came to be and how they got into action. But it goes back quite a way. The RAF was created in 1918, and we've had in recent years the commemoration of 100 years of the RAF in 2018, just the two years ago. The reason it was created was to fight away Zeppelins and Gotha bombers from bombing London, and also for reprisal raids against Germany. But after the war, those reasons to be didn't exist anymore. And as Britain was in a very poor economic state, the colonial secretary, as was at the time, was a certain chap called Winston Churchill. We had been given a number of protectorates to look after, Iraq, Afghanistan, Transjordan, that needed policing after the First World War. But we had very little money to which to do that with. At the same time, the chief of the RAF, Trenchard, was looking for a means for the RAF to survive on at the end of the First World War. So between Churchill needing someone to help him financially, Trenchard needed Churchill. Trenchard came up with the idea of sending aircraft to what was called the Somaliland campaign that had been bothering Britain for a number of years. There was a chap there called the Mad Muller. He was neither mad nor a Muller, but the aircraft was sent out there to stop the fighting and bring, it to, bring the fighting to a close. And it only lasted a few weeks, but it is known as the cheapest war in history. It cost about £70,000 which was a lot less than the five million that was expected to cost moving an army out there to solve the problem. And as those were successful, basically the DH-9 here, the de Havilland 9, can be looked at as the aircraft that saved the RAF. There's one flying and surviving, and that's at the Imperial War Museum at Duxford. Afterwards, Churchill requested Trenchard bring in this air policing, as it's called, to look over these other areas of the empire. And Trenchard, to keep the RAF going, was more than happy to oblige. The downside was we had aircraft that were built for the First World War in Europe and basically temperate climates, and we're sending them out to tropical climates. But as there was no other money, it had to be done that way. And it's known very much as make, do and mend. We had to send European aircraft out to, out to the empire. Now, at the same time, at the end of the war, the company Sopwith, that many will know from the fame of the Sopwith Camel and the World War I aces, had been accused of profiteering, so he had to start a new company, based at Kingston-upon-Thames, and the company was called Hawker, working with an Australian chap called Harry Hawker, who sadly was killed in 1921 in an air accident. The company was set up as HG Hawker Engineering. A designer moved over to Hawkers, called Sidney Cam, who'd been working in the First World War, and he moved over and by 1925 became chief designer. At the end of the First World War, Cam was looking at captured German aircraft. And this is a Fokker triplane that everyone will know as the aircraft that the Red Baron flew. This would be bright red, doesn't show in the black and white of course, but we would all pretty much know the aeroplane. Cam wrote a book about his discoveries when he expected the German aircraft and basically came over with some ideas of how he would want to design his aeroplanes. It's the only book he ever wrote, and it's called Aircraft Construction, and it's from 1919. He looked at aircraft, uh, in this instance the Fokker triplane, it was welded. And he was thinking that there was no way that the aircraft could go around to different parts of the empire and have welding kit to repair it. So he had to look at other solutions in his designs. The Ministry of Munitions carried out the same assessment and said basically the Fokker triplane, even though it had been very successful, 
The Red Baron was the highest scoring ace of the First World War with 80 victories and we said his aeroplane was no use, which does sound a little bit arrogant, but it does mean that we were looking at how we could design and build aircraft. And in the 1920s and 30s, aircraft construction was mainly built on small air ministry contra uh, contracts. And that's often been criticised as being like a cottage industry, just small factories building these things, and you know, handmade aircraft just about. But without the big contracts being awarded, there was no need for them to be anything bigger. So it's a little bit of a, a hard criticism with hindsight. But our main enemy shifted in the early 1920s to being France as a perceived threat. It was called the French Air Menace. And we were thinking of waves of French bombers coming over because they had more aircraft than we did. And we'd reduced our air force so we had to do something about it. So in 1922 we expanded what was called the Home Defence Expansion Scheme. We had 23 squadrons in that scheme. And the following year we increased that to 52 squadrons. Now, the aircraft that had to do the job had to climb fast and intercept. So this created a culture of what was called interception fighters or interceptors. That will be similar to what we're going to run into with the Spitfire later. This is now 1922-23, so years before the Spitfire and Hurricane were designed. The aircraft in the 20s had to fly in day and night and they needed manageable landing speeds if they were going to land at night. The actual landing speed for aircraft coming down onto grass, and we only had grass airfields at the time, was a part of the design. As far as the Empire was concerned, the aircraft had to land on rough strips in the middle of deserts or in the middle of plains, hills, etc. And basically they had to have slow landing speeds. In addition to that, what was being found was aircraft out in the Empire were rotting and falling apart. Wooden aircraft in hot temperatures is something they weren't really built for. So we had to look at metal construction. And we also needed supercharged engines to be able to get over the mountains. The other reason for looking at wooden aircraft is that termites and other bugs love wooden construction. So basically they wouldn't last very long and fall apart after a period of time which isn't suitable for Air Force aircraft. The First World War, the wooden aircraft were basically handmade, but from 1925 it was decided to equip the RAF with all metal aircraft. I mentioned Sidney Cam earlier on. Very little has been written about him in comparison with R.J. R. J. Mitchell of the Spitfire fame. From 1925, Sidney Cam became chief designer at Hawker. His partner in the company, he was working for originally, he became a partner afterwards, was Tommy Sopworth that I mentioned earlier from Sopwith Camel fame in the new company Hawkers. Now Cam looked at metal construction and what he was looking at was steel strip for example to bring and build the wing spars. These were rolled into shape to give the aircraft strength and there's a whole series of drawings that show how this would work out but it all had to be buildable and the aircraft had to be repairable in the field by the RAF fitters in the middle of Iraq or Afghanistan or Egypt. They all had to be repairable. This is a Hawker stri a steel strip spar section and it gives the wing great strength. It would be two spars with a web sitting in between them to give the wing strength. And although the aircraft are supposed to be all metal, uh, a lot of the construction was wood and it would be covered by fabric as well. But it is the start of metal construction. You can just see in the wing there is only a part of the wing that is the spar section. Later on the wings went on to be all metal. Cam had made his notes in 1919, this is one of them, and he would take this type of construction forward to build these multi-joints. Now whilst it looks very complicated it meant that the ordinary man in the field could fit the wing and, and fit these, these steel tubes together and repair them and keep them going in the middle of the campaign areas in Afghanistan and Iraq. And basically you end up with what's called a tubular structure. That was Hawker's principal design for the biplanes that are coming in towards the end of the 1920s. Square tubes, these were built for example Ackles and Pollock, Smethwick in Birmingham, and they will be held together by what are called fish plates. A First World War aircraft like the Sopwith Pup would have a wooden fuselage. You can see the structure is basically laid out and the Hawker tubes would replace it. 
To get a current engineering assessment, Guy Black of Retrotech is one of the world's leading aircraft restorers, and he's been restoring the Hawker biplanes from the 1920s and 30s. And basically, Guy's comments are that it was a simple substitution for wood. But it also meant that parts could be transported easily and put together, comparatively easy, with unskilled labour. Now we start to look at the engines to power these aeroplanes. This is going to lead on to the fighters of the late 1930s. In 1918, you would have an aeroplane like the DH-9 with a Puma engine. That's 18 litres for 200 horsepower. Huge engine, 18 litres but not generating very much power. Rolls-Royce had built V-12 engines in the First World War, such as the Eagle, and it also built the Falcon engine that went into the Bristol Fighter that was one of the aircraft used in the make, do and mend through the Empire. At the same time, British, American and Italian air forces were looking at racing aircraft. Now, we were racing biplanes in the Schneider Trophy, that's very well known, but in 1923, the Americans came over and won with an aeroplane called the Curtis CR-3. And looking at it, it's a very sleek machine for the 1920s. And in 1925, they came over and won it again with Lieutenant Doolittle, uh, who very, went on to become very famous in the Doolittle Raiders uh, attacking Japan in 1942. The aircraft now exists in the Air and Space Museum. But the most notable thing about it is it had a V12 engine of about 23 litres called the D12. This is going to have a critical effect on aircraft design. The company Fairy that went on to make the Fairy Swordfish later on ordered the Curtis D12 and put them in the Fairy Fox, which was a bomber. But the bomber was faster than the fighters of the day. So Trenchard, as the chief of the RAF, ordered some of the Fox and to quote, he said, I'm going to stir things up. In other words, put a hornet in the midst of the aircraft designers to get them moving. And Trenchard wanted British built V12 engines. And the most successful company at the time was a company called Napier. And they were building engines for aircraft and racing cars and they were offered the chance to build a V12. But they turned it down, they said they're too busy. Arthur Rowledge, who was a designer at Napier, left them and went to Rolls-Royce and he built the Rolls-Royce F engine. That engine became known as the Kestrel which is a V12, again, 22.6 litres. And the Kestrel would put the design into the front of Hawker biplanes in the late 1920s. Very sleek and very streamlined. Interestingly, the Messerschmitt 109, when it flew in 1935, had a Kestrel engine. Now the Hart went up against an aeroplane called the Avro Antelope for a contract called 1226. The Antelope lost because it wasn't repairable. It would take hours and hours and hours to make any major repair, whereas the Hawker Hart was very quickly repairable. And that was the reason for its being selected, the ease of maintenance, as well as its speed. It was very sleek at the front. And basically it was picked for that ease of maintenance on the grounds that it could be repaired at home or in the corners of the Empire. And it was awarded contract 1226. There was a whole family of Hart aircraft, Demon, Fury, Audax, and they all had different roles, army cooperation, fleet reconnaissance, etc. It is a critical aircraft in British aviation history. It could be subcontracted, in this instance, out to Gloucesters, Bristol, Armstrong, Whitworth and Vickers. So you would have the volume of production to be able to build the aircraft that you, that you needed. It was called the era of silver biplanes. This, for example, Hawk and Nimrod II. But a key aircraft I'm going to refer to now is the Hawker Fury. The Hawker Fury was an interception fighter. It had to climb to 20,000 feet as fast as it possibly could. It would be on the south coast, ready for aircraft that would cross or come in towards the south coast and get up and fight them. So we are create, creating a culture of interception fighters. It was also flown by many of the pilots that went on later to fly in the Battle of Britain. So a lot of the tactics they learned in the Fury carried forward with them into the Battle of Britain. A Rowledge, we mentioned earlier with the Kestrel engine, added five more litres to give us the 27.6 litre Rolls-Royce PV-12. PV is private venture, that means there were no contracts with it and the Rolls-Royce were taking a calculated risk to build the engine. But this became the Merlin, the most famous aircraft engine of all time and it had enough power now to get away from biplanes and to build a monoplane. The Hawker steel tube fuselage was found strong enough to manage the power of the Merlin. 
Now, just to give you some idea about the size of the, en the engine and the power, a Rolls-Royce Merlin is about 20 times the size of a VW Polo engine. And the later versions of the Merlin are twice the power of a Formula One car. And if you think about that in the Battle of Britain with an 18 or 19 year old in front, it gives it some context of the power. With the Merlin in front, the Hurricane became the first RAF aircraft faster than 300 miles per hour. So if we look at the Hawker biplanes, you would take off the top wing, give it retractable undercarriage, a Rolls-Royce Merlin, and basically you have a Hurricane. You're able to build them quickly, and that is critical in the late 1930s. It used existing technology. It's basically a Hawker biplane with one wing, and you could easily gear up production, and it was easy to subcontract and build the numbers that you needed. So the Hurricane prototype first flew in 1935, tested, and on into production. Now it's 30% cheaper to build than a Spitfire. The Spitfire, for example, is brand new technology. The Hurricane production is existing and comparatively easy to build technology, easy to subcontract. And the Spitfire stress skin construction was very difficult to get into production, it took some time. Here's one in the jig being under restoration. And any new technology we see, even, even today, takes time to bring in. Now, Alex Henshaw was the famous Spitfire test pilot. And Alex said to me, the Spitfire was difficult to produce and expensive, which it was. But such is new technology. The Hurricane, in the meantime, entered service in December 1937. And by September 1939, there were over 500 Hurricanes making 18 squadrons, with 3,500 on order. And when the Hurricane and the Spitfire both joined service, they had two-bladed propellers. Now, this is important in that if you're flying with a two-bladed propeller, it's fixed pitch, as it's called. It's like flying in third gear. So it's neither ideal on takeoff or in flight. You're not getting the maximum performance of the aeroplane. But that was later changed to a de Havilland propeller, which was two positions, so at least you had more performance at the top end of the envelope, more speed, but not ideal still. When it changed to what's called a constant speed unit, both for the Spitfire and for the Hurricane, you are maximising the performance of the aeroplane. And thankfully, these came in time for the Battle of Britain. Now, the first RAF ace of the Second World War was a New Zealander. And in the Battle of Britain, there are 127 New Zealanders. And for a tiny country, that is a huge proportion. But Cobber Kane, as he was called, first RAF ace of the Second World War, uh, got his victories in the Battle of France and was killed sadly at the end of the Battle of France. But there were many more hurricanes used in the defence of France. Spitfires were too valuable to send over there, although a number were lost at Dunkirk. So we had to come back and defend the home country. That was our highest priority. So 32 squadrons of hurricanes and only 19 squadrons of Spitfires. So the critical mass of aircraft defending Britain at the Battle of Britain were hurricanes. Tom Neal of 249 Squadron, based up the road from here at North Weald, said the Hurricane was a cart horse and the Spitfire was a racehorse. But a cart horse is nice and reliable. He also said that if you ever had to do a belly landing in a Hurricane, you're sitting in the middle of a huge steel tube fuselage. And it's a bit like, to quote Tom, sitting in the middle of the fourth bridge. Now there are a number of repair schemes for Hurricanes so that they could be repaired in the field and with their squadrons. With the Spitfire, it's considerably more complicated to repair with its stress skin fuselage. An advantage of the steel tubes of the, of the Hurricane is that sometimes you would be shooting through the aeroplane and it wouldn't hit anything. And if you did hit the tubes, they could be replaced comparatively easily by the ground crews on the airfield. The Hurricane could take tremendous damage and still get home. Ginger Lacey, a very famous 501 Squadron Battle of Britain Ace, landed once with 87 bullet holes in his Hurricane. 661 Hurricanes were returned to service after combat damage, which is a considerable return. And the ease of maintenance that had always been the plan for the Hawker aircraft in the 1920s and 30s was critical to this. The design enabled the more easy repair. We also produced considerably more aircraft than the enemy, so we were replacing any losses. And this was a, another critical factor. It would take considerably longer to service a Spitfire, but only nine minutes to turn around a Hurricane and have it ready for combat again. There was also the use of 100 octane fuel that came in, to the, came in at the time of the battle, so you could get maximum power out of the engine. The Luftwaffe only used 87 octane, so they didn't generate as much power for similar fuel use. 
The Hurricanes had a much higher serviceability rate, 60, 60 plus percent, and the Spitfires just, uh, just under 40 percent serviceability. It's also said the Hurricanes go after the bombers. Now that's only partially true. There was a series of memos by Keith Park of Eleven Group saying, literally in September uh, 1940, that you should go after the bombers if possible. But to quote Gunter Rall of JG52, who ended up at the end of the war with 275 victories, he said, once you're in a fight, you are in. You have to figure out how you're going to fight and how you, you fight it, what's in front of you, and then get out. 303 Polish Squadron was the most successful of them all. Again, Hurricane Squadron. The two Hurricane Aces in a day, Tony Glavaki and Archie McKellar. It's five kills in a day. The only Victoria Cross won by Fighter Command in the entire war was won by James Nicholson flying a Hurricane that was on fire whilst he was fighting a Messerschmitt 110 down near Southampton. Joseph Franticek, who was very much a lone wolf pilot with the Polish squadron, although he was Czech, and he was the high scoring non-RAF pilot during the battle. The Polish heritage, heritage flight Hurricane at Duxford has just been unveiled in Franticek's markings. The opposition, Messerschmitt 109s, the bombers, the Messerschmitt particularly lethal in combat, 27 Victory Ace, uh, Horse Titan of JG-51, used to refer to Hurricanes as Old Puffers. And he was shot down by a Hurricane 501 squadron on the 18th of August. The most famous combat of the Battle of Britain was, was by Sergeant Ray Holmes. On Battle of Britain Day, 15th of September 1940, he dived and cut the tail off of a Dornier 17, as is shown in the painting by Jeff Nupkins, Combat Over London. Hurricanes shot down on 55% of aircraft in the Battle of Britain, and Spitfires shot down 42%. After the battle, Hurricanes then went on to be outnumbered in Malta and hang on to defend the island there. They also went on to the Greek campaign, where the high scoring ace of the RAF, Marmaduke St. John Pattle, was killed at the Battle of Athens as a gladiator and hurricane pilot. And this is all recorded in Roald Dahl's excellent book, Going Solo. Dahl himself was a hurricane ace, flying in the Greek campaign and in the Middle East. But the hurricane had limitations to development as a frontline fighter, mainly due to the thickness of the wing, and it would therefore go on to be a multi-role combat aircraft. Now the wing meant that no matter what power you put on the hurricane, and I've flown two with considerably different power, they're still basically the same speed you can't get them going very much faster. But it was immensely strong. The Focke-Wulf Condors at the time were going after the convoys and we didn't have carriers to be able to get to protect the convoys. So what they did was they put launch ramps on the front of merchant ships and they called them cam ships, catapult ones. The Hurricane would literally be fired off by rockets. Now bravery is a term often used but take off in your aeroplane, fired off by rockets off a merchant ship, climb up to height, fight the enemy, and then you can't land on your ship, so you have to bail out and hope you're going to get picked up in the Atlantic or wherever you're serving. Very brave people. The Sea Hurricane as well. Strong undercarriage, so more suited than the Spitfire was to use on carriers. Protection of the Arctic convoys. It is a multi-role combat aircraft. We've got to protect the convoys getting through. And also flying in Russia. Hurricane sent out to fight there. Night intruders. The rolls go on. Hurry bombers. Bombs under the wing for ground attack. Tank busters with the giant guns underneath. 40 millimeters. You'd be carrying 15 of those aside for shooting up the enemy uh, convoys in North Africa. But it's not just down to the guys. There was a constant supply of aircraft needed at the squadrons, and we all know now the stories of the Air Transport Auxiliary moving aircraft to the squadrons. This is Eleanor Fish, 1943. Eleanor was an architect, trained as a pilot, and would, would, one of the aircraft she trained on was the Hawker Park Trainer, which was now out of being a bomber and made as a trainer to get people used to flying the big engines. Before, they go on to fly Hurricane. This is the Hurricane number five, and Eleanor's first Hurricane. It was an X601 Battle of Britain squadron aircraft. Now, Eleanor's 102 years old, and we last spoke last night.
still going strong. Burma and India, hurricanes were hard wearing, had to survive the jungle conditions there and fight out there with Indian pilots such as squadron leader Mahinda Puji, DFC, through the Mediterranean, the Balkans, carrying rockets. What other aircraft could have done this at the time? Only the hurricane. It's a combination of what was required from the economic environment, the end of First World War, what the threats were in the 1920s with the French air menace, protecting the empire and the designs that went into the Hart aircraft that would then come forward into the hurricane and the threats of the 1930s. The hurricane is still very much the unsung hero. One of the reasons for that potentially is that after the war, because they're made of wood, tube, fabric, etc., they would then rot over time. So this is Collie's scrapyard in the 1960s. That aircraft will be worth millions now, but just thrown on a scrap heap. But thanks to the resurrection of Hawker engineering techniques by Guy Black at Retrotech and the restoration of Hawker restorations over in Suffolk, they're being brought back to life and many, very many more of them being restored today. I will tell one story from a combat uh, veteran Spitfire pilot. I was flying the Hurricane one day and I was speaking to Jeff Wellham. Jeff Wellham, 92 Squadron Battle of Britain, uh, one of the youngest pilots in the battle, 18 years old. And his book is outstanding, First Light, very well known bestseller. Jeff said to me, what are you flying today, Howard? I said, oh, I'm flying the Hurricane. He said, oh, I'm just so sorry. As Jeff was a bit of a Spitfire devotee, God bless him. The Spitfire was a magnificent aeroplane, but it was not available in the numbers that were needed, particularly during the early days of the battle. For that, we needed the Hurricane. It's very much uh, a critical factor in the Battle of Britain, but there were many others. And we're standing on one of them here today. The first integrated air defense system in the world was another critical factor. But without the Hurricane, we would have lost, but thankfully we didn't, and it's that down to the hurricane that we, that we continued on in the battle. One of the things I would like to remember today is 15th of September, Battle of Britain Day. We remember the fallen, and in this particular instance I'd like to remember Flight, Flying Officer Michael Jebb, who was shot down on 15th of September, flying his hurricane with 504 Squadron, and he is buried at Greystead Old Church in Kielder Forest. The unsung hero, but hopefully when you look at it again, you'll appreciate her a bit more. Thank you very much.